Thank you very much. It's a, again a pleasure to be here. I think we had some fantastic uh, talks this morning. I really enjoyed them. I hope you did as well. Um, some of my uh, discussion here will essentially perhaps maybe incorporate some of those earlier talks because I think they all made some very, very good points. Uh, this is a workshop, so as uh, we said, this is very informal. My goals are really to go over the settings for APRV. Instead of giving you a lot of our research and our data, uh, we're going to just present how you actually set it. So we're going to go over every, every settings, the physiologic rationale for these settings, and uh, hopefully that will encourage some, some questions. Unfortunately, it is an hour, um, and so we'll try to do the best we can. And also, we're, we're starting with the premise, I think it's very important, is that we, we have evolved because we've used APRV for so long in our thinking. I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, but our evolution really has gone to prevention. And prevention of uh, acute lung injury, ARDS, but also what I would say prevention of, of ICU diseases. I think we actually create a lot of our own problems. That's my premise uh, behind a lot of things, and so this is where uh, this motivation. So first, a little bit of background. I think there's a pointer here. Uh, APRV, just very quickly, most, probably the easiest way to conceptualize quickly is that it's a CPAP type of breath. So that means the patient can superimpose their breathing pattern any time they want. So that's the idea, is the patient's actually breathing on CPAP. The CPAP is released intermittently, and so what that creates is these CPAP blocks, if you will. And in fact, if I were to color this area right here, this would essentially be a straight line and the patient would be doing 100% of their minute ventilation uh, using uh, APRV. And as you can see here, Penny is doing this on the ventilator. The patient can actually, the patient who's actually Penny on a test lung, who's actually breathing here, the gray breaths represent the breathing. So this is really, uh, again, if this was, uh, if I colored this completely blue, it would seem just pure CPAP. The releases really are there to aid in the metabolic loading that occurs in critically ill patients because they produce more carbon dioxide. And so to some extent we're using pressure to create a more favorable uh, point of inspiration, a, a pressure volume a point where the patient is above FRC and below uh, TLC. So they're, they're at the compliant part of their pressure volume curve. That's our goal and that's what we're trying to do is to decrease the elastic work of breathing with the pressure decrease the metabolic work by intermittently releasing the, uh, the pressure and putting fresh gas in. So that, in, in essence, is, is APRV. Here's the main settings, and the names are, <clears throat> you know, we could call this p -insp and make it pressure control. We could combine these two and call it a respiratory rate. These are all the key elements, and fundamentally, I think what's important here, uh, because you can actually use this in a spectrum of diseases, but you obviously will adjust it differently for different diseases, which perhaps unlike conventional ventilation where we tend to sort of just focus on some very small uh, points, we might actually want to adjust these things based on the mechanics of the lung directly as we look at waveform graphics, which are very important in APRV, is to actually look at the waveform graphics. So I'm going to go through each one of these settings and uh, tell you some of the, what we call important methodology for our, what we've done in our patients and our clinical, uh, our experimental data that shows that you can actually prevent lung edema, ARDS, and all the histopathology that comes along with it. But one of the key things is actually to make it as much CPAP as you can. In other words, the patient is essentially on pure CPAP. The time of the release, when you add it up, if you have a rate of 10 and a 0.5 second release, that's uh, two minutes, so the bulk of the time the patient's in a CPAP phase of breathing. So that, that's really critical. And you can actually accomplish an the entire ventilation that you need, even in, in a non-spontaneously breathing patient, with this. And again, the key thing is to start the lung normal and keep it normal. And that, that, that's actually, again, the premise behind this. A couple of key things that are different about uh, APRV, uh, you know, quickly, is that we are trying to maintain an alveolar volume. So if the alveoli are open, then, then when the heart returns blood, it's going to dump the carbon dioxide into that space, and hopefully what will happen is the gas will keep moving up to try to occupy uh, areas where there's less carbon dioxide. And hopefully what we can get is more diffusion, and then, of course, once we do that, we release the, the, uh, the gas full of carbon dioxide and we put fresh gas in to continue this process. So what we're trying to do is combine diffusive ventilation and convective ventilation. And actually that's what happens 
in normal lungs. You know, just very quickly, since we talked about volumetric CO2 this morning, I think it's important to just show, you know, very quickly, here's volume, here's your end tidal. You see this little area right here, of course, represents the dead space. Gas is uh, the anatomic dead space here, so we're, we're flushing out on conventional ventilation. But as soon as we switch over to APRV, you see a straight line up because the gas has actually moved up into the bigger airways, and so we have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. So the, the dis distance between these two increases the CO2 per volume that you're removing. So it's actually very efficient in carbon dioxide removal. So that's just a rough overview. Now, one of the things that is not necessarily essential, but is definitely a adds another element to APRV, is that you're positioning a patient to start spontaneous breathing. So to some extent, in our unit, what we try to do is get people breathing as soon as we can. We actually try to get them to breathe within 24 hours of their admission, uh, regardless of their shock state, uh, any, any of those factors. And certainly there's some information about uh, spontaneous breathing being bad for you, but I just want to point out one thing, which is really important. It seems as though APRV is the only mode where you can spontaneously breathe, and I would just tell you that that's absolutely not true. Unless you paralyze the respiratory system, the muscles, the brain stem will still want to, will get feedback from the lungs, from uh, blood gases, and drive breathing. In fact, you can remove the cerebral cortex, and the patient will still breathe. So it's really a, a, a something that cannot be sedated away when someone has a lot of distress. But this is a low tidal volume strategy patient. And what I want to just point out, if you look carefully, the patient is actually pulling their airway pressure down, their PEEP level down, and they're actually developing a lot of pleural pressure to suck this pressure waveform down. So just because you're, on, you're not on APRV, it doesn't mean you cannot breathe. Uh, in fact, I'll just show you that in an adult patient with a rigid thorax, it's very, very uh, <laughs> un unusual to, to have this happen unless you develop high pleural pressure. In other words, this patient's sternum is being sucked inward during inspiration. And of course, there's an intimate relationship between the thorax and the lungs. The chest needs to expand as the, in order for the lungs to expand. You can't have a shrinking thoracic cavity and expect good aeration. So this type of dyssynchrony is really unfavorable and can generate huge pleural pressures, which aren't good for you. Now, the thing is with APRV, is that you're actually trying to silence inspiratory muscle activity. And what I mean by that, it changes your way of breathing to focus on expiratory muscle use instead of inspiratory. In other words, expiration becomes active and inspiration becomes passive. And let me just explain a little bit. So if you look at the EMGs uh, related to CPAP level, because in, again, APRV is very similar to CPAP, what's happening is the EMG output of, the, of both uh, portions of the diaphragm, the costal and the coral portion, progressively go down. Now, obviously, the position of the diaphragm is important, but also when the brain is more satiated, there's less desire to inhale. In fact, you actually switch over to your brain wanting to exhale your lung volume down. And that's actually collectively termed defending your lung volume. So I'll try to describe this a little bit better as we go along, and I have some videos. But what we're doing here is as you look at the diaphragmatic change, this is change in pressure, you can see that as you inflate the lung volume, the, progress, the active portion of diaphragmatic contraction goes down, but you still maintain total. And similarly, you can see here this is passive, which is here, and this is active, and this is the lung volume is actually created by more passive expansion of the chest rather than active expansion of the chest. And this is my final sort of technical slide on this, but I just want to point out, here's the diaphragm EMG. So here's the signal. So this line denotes when the actual EMG fires. In other words, you can detect the electrical signal. But well before that, you have a tidal volume, you have flow of gas, and you have an, a, a pressure drop in the airway. And you can see that that occurs before actually the diaphragm's contracting. And what's happening, hopefully I can illustrate this as that, uh, let me just stop here for a second and explain the video. But this is, what you're going to see here is the patient will actually be squeezing their lung volume as you have your pressure high. So during that CPAP phase, the patient actually loads their expiratory muscles just slightly. And then when, as soon as they relax, it's, um, it's like a spring-loaded event and the, ch and the chest starts to expand with air. So it becomes very passive. 
and hopefully you'll be able to see that here. It really is difficult to capture on video, but hopefully what you'll see is the, a lot of activity with the belly. There's the squeeze, and then when he relaxes, the chest should spring out a little bit. But otherwise, there's very little inspiratory movement. In fact, you should look for essentially that balance where they're not actively exhaling continuously because that's too much expiratory work and that may be someone who's rejecting the lung volume. You want sort of a balanced lung volume, not too big, not too high, so that you're at the right portion. Um, this patient, uh, I don't know if it's any better. You can sort of see their abdomen squeeze here a little bit. You'll see just a... And of course you can feel this and then they relax and the chest will spring up. Let me try one more patient. Uh, maybe this is a little bit better. This patient, I want you to look, since he has a large abdomen, it might be uh, easier to see. I just need to come around the side here. Is that playing? Okay. Oops. Somehow we skipped over here. Okay. Let's come around the side. And right here, I want you to see the abdomen. He's going to squeeze his abdomen down and then he's going to his chest is going to spring out. I don't know if you're able to see that. It's very subtle, uh, but as I said, it's in, in real life, it's uh, much easier to see. The other important thing is what pressure do we want to use? And we'll talk a little bit about why we need pressure. We need pressure to help the patient breathe here. The idea is not to use the ventilator as a ventilator. In fact, the brainstem is a superior ventilator in my mind because that's the neural output that you want to use. We don't need a clock and a ventilator or a timer to go off. We'd rather use something that the patient wants to use. They, the patient wants to, to set their inherent rhythm of breathing. So what we're trying to do is just position the patient in a part of their pressure volume curve where it's easy to breathe. And that's where we breathe from. We do not like breathing up here. In fact, we can't breathe up here. Our diaphragms are flat. There's no way to actually move volume. The only thing you do is pressurize <coughs> the system. When your lung is airless below FRC, it's equally hard to generate volume. You just create pressure and nothing really happens. So the nice thing about spontaneous breathing, it's like taking a blanket off. Instead of doing fancy things, you can just look at how the patient's breathing. So for example, this patient, this patient is a COPD -er who were uh, feeding McDonald's daily for obesity. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, which is, you know, I don't know when we're going to be prescribing that. But this patient actually is on 35 of pressure. Now, if I put any of you guys on 35 of pressure, I promise you would be very unhappy with me and you would not feel com comfortable. You would be at total lung capacity. You wouldn't be able to do anything with your diaphragm. Your diaphragm would probably be inverted. Uh, and so there's no way that you're going to be comfortable. Now, this patient is taking huge tidal volumes. The patient's breathing spontaneously at a rate of 14. He's doing 8 liters out of 12 as spontaneous. So this is the spontaneous side of APRV. This is the machine side, which is the to incorporates the total here. But you can see large volume. If he was at his total lung capacity, I promise you there's no way that he's going to do that. And if he was below lung volume, it would, he would be very distressed into kipnic. So the thing I'm leaving out to you is this patient is, in fact, almost 300 kilograms with an open abdomen, septic, massively resuscitated, and 35 is what gets him not to TLC, but to a part of his pressure volume curve where he can breathe. And again, that's really important because I think as we talked about, transpulmonary pressure is an important concept, and we need to somehow factor that into the whole situation. Now, one more thing about spontaneous breathing, which I think was uh, mentioned by Luigi, earlier with EIT is that spontaneous breathing really has a better distribution of ventilation. It's better to pull air into your lung than to push air into your lung as long as you are not developing high pleural pressure. And this is just the difference between paralyzed ventilation and the huge diaphragm moved way up into the chest, collapsed lung. We have a lot of movement in the sternum. You can see the chest wall, anterior chest wall moving quite a bit. In CPAP breathing, it's the abdomen that's moving. The chest wall is actually pretty silent. And you can see that there's more movement down here, just much more favorable, even distribution of ventilation, which ultimately, I believe, is the way to protect the lung. The, you need to protect the lung by maintaining a home, more homogeneous lung as opposed to a lung that's collapsed over here, overinflated over here. This is where it becomes very difficult and our options become much, much less. So keeping the lung as healthy as possible, which I think you can do, uh, is perhaps uh, one of the, the advantages. Now remember that this is really a pleural pressure modification. So is prone positioning. 
So the spectrum is there's more than one way to modify pleural pressure. One is the patient can actually take a breath and pull some air into the basis for you because that's where preferentially the gas comes. It's, it's when you force air into the passive system that it tends to go by the micromechanics more of the, the system. I'm just going to skip over some EIT, uh, but in this one, just very, very quickly, I just want to show this is the maximum aeration. This is on low tidal volume strategy. Patient's not breathing very well here, but this the patient is starting to breathe here. And you can see there's a shift more to the basilar part of the lung when you actually start um, spontaneous breathing. I think we also need to consider something which is the diaphragm. You know, we believe that weaning should start as soon as you intubate, or the concept of weaning. In other words, mechanical ventilation is fine, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to get that patient off mechanical ventilation, so I think we need to start thinking about how do you get this patient off ventilation as soon as you intubate them. So what you don't want to do in the first 24, 48 hours is create a problem for yourself later. In other words, we're just going to kick this problem down the road. Next thing you know, we have a patient with diaphragm dysfunction, and perhaps, perhaps that might have some implication for delayed weaning. And we spend a lot of time in weaning, and this is where patients are very, in my mind, susceptible, because they're not moving that fast. We don't want to push them too hard, too slow. Everything is, is fraught with danger, because then what happens is we, um, we expose the patients to more infections and complications. Okay, so... Hopefully there's no questions so far. Okay, <clears throat> now we're gonna talk specifically about the different uh, parameters. And I wanna focus first on this P low of zero. So again, if you were to look at this, well, what's crazy about this is many things. Well, first of all, 28 going to zero looks bad. I mean, there's no question it looks bad. It looks bad because we know from ventilator-induced lung injury studies that you can take an animal and you go from 28 to zero, and that's the most efficient way to actually destroy an animal's lungs. And I've done it personally, and that's very, very rapid versus, you know, a, a more slow approach with a little bit of PEEP. Even low PEEP slows it down a little bit. And secondly, uh, we may end up seeing that the volume that comes out is quite big. So those are a bit contrary, but I, I just want to explain a little bit further, which is that we don't control end expiratory lung volume through pressure, but we do in fact control it, but we use time. And the notion there is that time constants, or the cluster of time constants, is more uh, in, a, in a narrower spectrum than the PEEP spectrums that you might see in a patient's lungs. So that's really the premise behind it. And we specifically want to actually set it to uh, uh, based on the peak expiratory flow. Now, this peak expiratory <laughs> flow is going to be dependent on many things. The peak expiratory flow, whether the patient has an obstructive lung disease, whether the patient has an obstructive endotracheal tube, the resistance of the endotracheal tube, in other words, the size of the endotracheal tube. You can, you can change the endotracheal tube and you'll change this flow pattern. It doesn't change where you should truncate this, but in essence, the time factor will change because, in fact, we've changed the respiratory system, which is essentially now including the whole circuit, the endotracheal tube. This is now part of the patient uh, for practical purposes that this is what you're going to be dealt with until you get the patient off the mechanical ventilator. So this is what we're trying to do. And Penny, I don't know if you can show what happens. You can see here it takes very little time incremental change, and this is obviously a test lung, but I can tell you in human beings, it's very, very small changes can result in dramatic uh, potential for de-recruitment. So this is one of the most important things about uh, APRVs. We set this to this flow pattern as opposed to a number, and we want this particular flow pattern. So I think what she's done is increase the time low, and you can see the point of this inflection point, if you will, or this point where the flow truncates and goes back up, you've let more air out of the lung. And what we're trying to do here is get some estimation of lung volume. In other words, we have a picture. Unlike PEEP, where you just dial a number and we don't really know, and we're using pressure, but when we talk about the circulation, we don't want pressure, we want volume. Volume is something that we really care about. What I care about is the lung volume. What's the lung? I want to keep the lung volume stable. I don't want to go from inflated to deflated. And so we want some visual surrogate of that. So that's why we use the, the flow pattern. So the flow over time is a, a representation of volume. This is time over here, and this is flow. 
So this area under this curve is exactly the, the volume, the expiratory volume. So by truncating it and projecting where you go to baseline, you can get some idea of your end expiratory lung volume. And this should always be bigger than this in terms of area because then there's a problem. The lung is closing you down very, very rapidly. <clears throat> now I'll just show you uh, APRV set incorrectly. Uh, this is what happens. You get a lot of opening and closing. Remember, we're using zero pressure. At some point, if you extend the time out long enough, you will, in fact, get zero pressure. What we're trying to do is we're retaining this CPAP. So when we drop the pressure, the lung already has a certain amount of pressure. We're trying to retain some of that. We're not trying to let it all out. We're trying to maintain it and then go back up. Because obviously in the lung, you don't really have this, this pattern. It doesn't dip quite down as much. You can see that there's essentially a little peep level there. But again, that's not in the lung. That's in the ventilator circuit on the north end of the endotracheal tube, not the south end of the endotracheal tube. So if you, set, if you set it correctly, and this is an injured lung model. This is a tween and high tidal volume lung injury. The lung is very stable once you go back to 75%. Now this is acute lung injury. This is not obstructive lung disease. This is how you'd set it for acute lung injury or, or ARDS or someone who has the potential for that. Um, can I, I just yeah. want to um, definitely go back to that uh, previous slide. Actually, what prompted this um, uh, in vivo microscopy was that I was reading an article that was titled APRB had the highest work of breathing and uh, you know of course I was like that's not what we see at all but indeed it most likely was and the reason was because the T lows were set so extraordinarily long and we're talking that's why I said this at 1.2 seconds. We actually duplicated the study. And th this actually went to zero. I mean, it goes all, the flow goes all the way to zero. So they're actually, the lung is collapsing. So that's, that's what actually prompted this. It's not, you know, just to, just to show the difference. It is how some people said it. So that was very important to see. And, and as Dr. Abashi will show you, that we actually took that a step further and did an, an abstract on that. <coughs> So if you look at the lung grossly, and this is our rat hemorrhagic model, again, we're going to zero here, but actually there's very little movement. So coming back to what you see on the ventilator, 28 to zero, the lung is actually moving very, very little. So there's very little movement in, in, in the, uh, the lung. Uh, similarly, just very quickly, this is one of our pig lungs after 48 hours of septic shock. And I think you just saw a release there. Very, very uh, brief movement. And that little movement can actually take care of a lot of ventilation. I think there'll be, the, uh, there was another release there. Now, again, if you look at the intimacy between the chest, and the chest wall and the lung, you'll just see this on your patient. If they're not breathing, this is one of my post-operative patients who's just recovering from surgery. You can see that very little movement of the thorax. So even though on the ventilator it says they're going from 28 to zero, the lung is actually moving very, very little. So it's actually a low amplitude ventilation versus a high amplitude ventilation. Uh, just some quick uh, EIT. This is a plateau of uh, 31 here, 6 mLs, 10 of PEEP. And you can see that uh, we, 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 don't ret we don't retain the image on the screen here. And then as you add more PEEP, of course you do. But when you look at APRV, You'll, you'll notice that the aeration is maintained, again, even though you're using a P-low of zero. So in, un, in other words, we, we maintain the gas volume in the lung. And in fact, in our studies with injured lungs, it takes 24 a peep to produce the same alveolar, expiratory alveolar stability as it would with a, a T-low of zero set to 75% in an injured lung model. So of course, if you can save some pressure, that means your total pressure may not be as high. Any questions so far? This is the, yes, sir. Uh, when you're setting up, for example, let's take your bond standard patient up, where would you start with your peep height? That's coming right up. So uh, just to finish the T-low, the P-low uh, portion of the setting, uh, and again, setting P-low of zero is easy because it's zero. And then, of course, if you look at your flow pattern, you can figure out. You, of course, can freeze these things. Penny, can you show what happens when you freeze the waveform? You can freeze the waveform. As soon as you freeze the waveform, you get uh, a scroll bar that you can take over and you can actually uh, 
get your precise measurements, if you will. Uh, back to this one, you can see we're going to zero here. And again, you can see how unstable the lung is at end expiration. This is if you do 50%, you still have some alveolar instability. And 75%, we have essentially a very stable lung compar in comparison to previously. This is important because this may be a, a part of what causes more lung injury. And in our lab, when we produce alveolar instability, this is what we see versus this is what we see with APRV and more homogeneity. So this is looking at the percent in this area of alveoli that are uh, inflated. So the circles encase inflated alveoli, and the red area that is not encased is the area of derecruited lung. And you can see that we don't have very good recruitment. This is 16 a peep after lung injury, and then we go to an exhalation, and we lose a lot of our alveoli. And also the alveoli are very different shapes. They're actually not uniform, and some are very big. Here we have much more uniformity in our alveoli, and the histology just completely looks different. And this is actually just six hours of uh, instability, it's a small animal model. And I do think, personally, that it's probably better to control end expiratory lung volume with time than pressure. And one of the reasons, besides the spectrum of PEEP levels that you might find, is that PEEP just doesn't maintain good end expiratory lung volume. We just increased the PEEP here to five, but what you're going to see is all of a sudden there's going to be loss of these recruited areas. So PEEP has this creep effect where the volume is actually redistributed out of the distal airspace and into the, actually the alveolar duct. And we have some data on that. I'll spare you that today, uh, but we do have some uh, data that we're working on. The distribution in the terminal airway is actually different. But there's still this creep effect, if you will, because we're just staying at that peep level just simply too long. And if we just use time, we may be able to capture just a more narrow spectrum and get the alveoli to behave uh, perhaps a little bit better. We still have this creep effect. It really takes us 20, 24 centimeters that we found is really what it takes to stabilize an injured lung. And this model is tween with high tidal volume to produce alveolar instability. So now the P-high, back to your question. So why do we want to use a P-high? Well, we said, firstly, we want to uh, create enough pressure so the patient's on a stable part of their pressure volume curve, just like we are. I mean, we're, we're breathing at a point where gas exchange or mechanics are efficient because your lung, your, your breathing, the act of breathing should cost the least amount of money, let's say, which is carbon dioxide and oxygen. So we will always want to ventilate with the least amount of energy. And so in order to do that, well, the chest has to overcome a lot of things in our, in our patients because we are not just ventilating a pair of lungs. And as uh, Dr. Grasso pointed out, we have the, the elastance of the chest wall. I would like to just take one uh, sort of additional piece of information there, which is that you need to think of this almost in four dimensions. You know, we look at x-rays, we look at thin CAT scans, but this is moving. And one of the things that's important is that the chest wall is actually an elastic structure, just like the lungs are. And the chest wall actually creeps. And in fact, if you look carefully, pleural pressure, as you hold pressure in the lung we, uh, and the chest wall, the chest wall is a slow compartment, and after a while you get progressive creeping, and the pleural pressure actually drops. So if you look carefully, we may also be affecting the pleural pressure by actually changing the, th the thoracic compliance. Similarly, if you look at stair-stepping recruitment maneuvers, they're generally tolerated better, and as Dr. Grasso pointed out, that the hemodynamics, as long as you're sending the energy to expand the thoracic cavity rather than towards the mediastinal structure, you're going to have better thoracic. But the lung inflates faster than the chest wall does. So the creep effect may be something we need to consider importantly. But also, the abdomen. And of course, now we know that the abdomen is a huge part of this, and this causes a lot of dysfunction. This is just one of my patients who actually received lots of gunshot wounds uh, for, I don't know what he was doing. Uh, but now you can see that when you resolve his ileus, he's able to inflate his lungs. So there's obviously an importance of this boundary, the abdomen. So of course, when we look at what we're doing to a patient, so a patient comes in, they don't have ARDS or acute lung injury, but we're going to resuscitate them. And I do believe a lot of our diseases are a byproduct of resuscitation. What's going to happen with resuscitation? We have permeability, we have inflammation, we're going to produce edema. We're going to lose extravascular plasma water, and it's going to go into spaces where ideally they wouldn't go to, but they're going to. 
So we're going to worsen respiratory mechanics. To some extent, the P high is to change, to go in concert with the changing and worsening of the whole respiratory system compliance. Because if you counter that, then you can maintain lung volume. Instead of the extrathoracic component shrinking the lung volume down, you're going to counter that with that continuous pressure. I would say that this is probably, in my opinion, one of the things that's kind of disappointing with recruitment maneuvers. I've never been able to reconcile the fact that recruitment maneuvers are very transient. But your swollen uh, patient is not transient. They stay like that for days and days and days. So how can we expect a maneuver that pops the lung open for a few hours and then all the things that want to collapse the lung again are still present? So we actually incorporate a, a diuretic approach, but I would tell you it's not diuresing the lung, it's actually diuresing the abdomen because of the ascites. And that's how we think sometimes that helps because clearly if you come back to EIT, as you increase pressure in the abdomen, and this is done with insufflation of CO2, you can see that you're essentially making the lung airless. And it's only until you actually use some countermeasure, in this case PEEP, that you're going to have some re-aeration. And then you take it away, which is the green bar here, and you go right back to where you were. So this transient approach may not be appropriate. So one way to think of the P-high, and sometimes I say this, is a continuous recruitment maneuver that you can ventilate through because essentially you're trying to somehow match against the forces that are trying to collapse the lung. And that's simply a bunch of these things. We know that the lung gets heavier because there's permeability in the lung, the heart's there, uh, the abdomen, and of course overall, as uh, Dr. Gould pointed out, this may not be a, a uh, normal position. And most of the time when the patients say, wait a minute, this is not a normal position, we tie them down to make sure they stay in that position. <laughs> So this is why we have a hand in a lot of this. And I'll just show you quickly some of our patients. Uh, you can see how tight his abdomen is, massive resuscitation here. This is actually a very unfortunate, uh, this is when we were doing ECMO. This is actually 1998, and uh, I have to tell you a story. This is the first patient that uh, we could not oxygenate, we couldn't do anything. He's on, his lungs are this big on the x-ray. Huge, huge, um, you know, hundreds of units of blood cells. I can't tell you how much, I can't even remember anymore quite high. Uh, this is the small intestines and so we're trying to figure out a way to to ventilate him and so I of course suggested proning. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think Penny liked that. None of the nurses uh, uh, liked that idea at all. Then they of course gave me a little, nice little hand gesture and uh, so we decided instead to stand the patient up and as soon as we stood this patient up he will finally hit 100% saturation. So we got him, he eventually died. I mean, he had half his liver was missing, bad shock. This, this patient actually had a transection through his aorta and vena cava. So both were completely wide open and just hemorrhaging to death. Uh, I don't know how many times he arrested. You know, to be honest with you, it's amazing he actually lived for three days. Um, but nonetheless, this is just to illustrate how important the abdomen is in the respiratory system. You have to push the abdomen away to make the thoracic cavity larger to actually accommodate the lung. And this is uh, from our lab. You can see that the pigs look nice before their septic shock. And then, you know, we're about to make their incision. This is after 57 liters of fluid. And you can see that they're very, very swollen, very, very tight. Uh, and this is what our, our pigs look like. Uh, but obviously, we need to counter. This is a force. This is actually a force that's going to transmit to the thoracic cavity, and it's going to transmit that pressure. So, of course, we can't just use pressure. We have to sustain that pressure because these forces are, in fact, sustained. And even if you just look at lung recruitment, we know that if you hold the right pressure, it takes a while for the lung to sort of uh, wiggle itself uh, stagger itself to more normal inflation. So it's really difficult to imagine how we will ever actually do that by not focusing on lung volume. And, you know, just very briefly, we think a lot about the airway pressures and all these numbers here. But what's really happening in the lung, well, the end game here is what's happening in the distal airspace. That's the business end of the lung. That's the functioning end of the lung. If you look at alveolar pressure, you can't really achieve it until you have a significant amount of time. So the lung is just opening, and then we take the pressure away. So I don't know if we can actually recruit uh, with, with that strategy, whereas you need a certain amount of time in order to do that.
Uh, in fact, this is what happens. This is 24 of PEEP with an, in an injured model, and we're going to transition to APRV, and you're going to see that with just a little, because of the time change, because our time is essentially prolonged here, if you will, you're going to see additional recruitment. And this is, of course, the idea is not to go up on pressure for recruitment, but to go this way for recruitment. So pressure is important, and we all think about pressure, but remember the recipe includes time. That's why recruitment maneuvers are done over a period of time. The problem is they're transient, and we may need more. So as, in essence, that's the idea of, of uh, the P high. Now just as a very quick clinical scenario, most of our patients, when you use this on normal lungs, post-operative lungs, people who are, you know, maybe just been resuscitated, most of our patients are between 20 and 30, with the majority being 20 to 25, somewhere around that as a pressure. In the old days, when we used to use this for rescue, we were well into the 40s and 45s. Now the caveats there are, of course, if you have a patient who you suspect their transpulmonary pressure, as the patient I described to you, that's this big, massively resuscitated, huge abdomen, it may be that their alveolar pressure is going to be significantly uh, safe at a 40, 45. And that's where we were uh, before uh, these patients. Now, I do want to talk about patient comfort uh, and just quickly uh, transition into weaning. And you can see what we try to do is get our patients up and walking. I will tell you that we use a lot of dexmedetomidine, and this allows us to do things like this. I think we, would, we, we used to do this, but it was really a much harder struggle. So I wouldn't say that we could not do it at all without dexmedetomidine, but it just makes it easier. It's much less of a hassle to actually get these people walking and moving. And uh, I'll just jump over to this, this patient. All of these patients, uh, at the time when we're actually walking them, they're still, by airway pressure, still pretty up, high up there. This patient's airway pressure, would you believe this guy's mean airway pressure is 27? And look, he's taking nice spontaneous breaths there. He's not distressed at all. This is after walking. His total minute ventilation or spontaneous, I don't know who the cameraman was. Well, actually, it was me. Uh, <laughs> let's see if we can go back to that uh, quickly. Um, but, but his mean airway pressure is 27. And again, he, he had massive resuscitation. He had lost his arm in a forklift and uh, had really bad shock and was bleeding and uh, a lot of tissue injury and what we call sterile sepsis. Um, and uh, so I won't. Uh, bore you with that, uh, but we obviously are able to walk a lot of our patients and they're quite comfortable. This is one of our chronic ECMO patients who was in the hospital for a long, long time. He had a massive BP fistula after essentially having bilateral lower lobe resections, uh, complete resection. So he just has his upper lobe and actually a partial upper lobe at that point and uh, finally got him off ECMO. Massive bilateral bronchopleural fistulas eventually became closed on their own. Uh, but he's going to take his first step here after a hundred and some days of being in the hospital. And uh, I think I'm going to take a picture of his feet here. There you go. What's amazing to me is that the next day, they just look so much stronger. I mean, I have sequential videos of our patients walking. And so what I would tell you is don't get discouraged. If you want to do this, even if you just stand and pivot for three seconds, the next day they'll do five seconds, then they'll take a step. And that's how you start this process. And I think, you know, we're always trying to get ahead of things. And uh, the reason, of course, is the ICU is full of complications. In fact, what I tell my fellows, I've renamed the ICU to the Intensive Complication Unit because that's what we're good at. We're good at creating more complications. So the, the first thing is to get out of our way of what we do to patients. And I want to talk about weaning quickly um, for the sake of time here. Weaning is actually fairly easy. What we're trying to do is increase the CPAP blocks, and we're trying to actually transfer the minute ventilation over to the patient. So what we do is increase the CPAP block, and that forces the minute ventilation to move over here. 
and then we assess whether the patient is capable of maintaining their work of breathing within a normal range. We don't want excessive work of breathing, but we don't want someone not breathing at all. So we're always trying to look at that. We also look at the morphology of the waveform uh, and uh, you know this total work of breathing, and we have an index that we look at to tell us whether someone's exceeded their work of breathing. Before this, we do something called a stretch test, which uh, Penny, maybe you can describe. So what we do is here's my patient just admitted not breathing. We could be overventilating the patient or the patient could be too sedate. So what we will do is increase the T high. We stay in the room, we increase the T high, and we look at their minute ventilation, their baseline minute ventilation. And after several minutes, depending on you know where their PCO2 is and where their rate of rise is, we determine whether they pass or fail this stretch test. And what that tells us is the patient cannot breathe. So their minute ventilation just drops, and you know sometimes that happens, it kicks into apnea ventilation, uh, but that's what ends up happening. And so we don't leave that patient. We put them back, then we discuss with the nursing staff, we renegotiate their pain sedation approach because we don't want to compromise on either, and we want to make sure that our patients breathe. So we actually are quite successful doing that in 24 hours. Sometimes it takes us a little bit longer, but the vast majority we can get these patients breathing. Once you get them breathing, it really is just comes down to can, uh, can you handle more work? I'm going to give you more s stuff to hold. And every time we do that, we just ask what their work of breathing is. And they tell us because they don't lie about that. The rate goes up and the tidal volumes go down. It's pretty predictive. So that's what we end up doing. And next thing you know, when you reach a certain pressure, uh, you will actually find yourself essentially on straight CPAP. And then when we get down to a certain level, typically we extubate our patients from 15 of CPAP successfully. Uh, as long as they meet other parameters. We use the rapid shallow breathing index, a modified version of it. Uh, and that's how we actually wean the patient. So you can see uh, hopefully, this is the screens we try to set up. So we want to know their minute ventilation total, how much, what percent. And you can see on the, now we have this. Uh, so this patient is doing 60% of their minute ventilation. So they're essentially 60%. And, and I'll tell you another thing is that when the patient is still being resuscitated and swollen, we actually do not lower the pressure. So in that case, we don't lower the pressure. We actually just extend the time. And so weaning is not just pressure reduction. Weaning is still actually incorporating the patient to, to do more breathing. So we look at weaning not just as weaning is only a pressure reduction in the system. And we reserve pressure reduction when the system is less edematous, when the compliance of the whole thing becomes uh, less edematous. And that's, I think, more integrated rather than focusing on the lung like we sometimes do as the only thing there, that it's just sitting there and that's the only thing we're doing. It has a lot of interactions with the rest of the body and which, uh, which state the patient is in, which phase of their illness are there. And certainly there's another phase where you're able to reclaim that edema fluid. We're able to diurese patients. To me, it makes more sense to reduce pressure when the whole system compliance is improving because you're diuresing the patient and they're putting out lots of fluid. So we actually reserve the pressure reduction to later. We call that more of a staggered pressure reduction. So you don't see a lot of pressure reduction and all of a sudden we're able to move very, very fast. The advantage of that from my perspective is that we've maintained lung volume. Whereas if you just go by weaning pressure, what you'll, if you notice, your lung will slowly start collapsing. And so we're setting up our patients for extubation failure, I think, because their lung keeps shrinking. And then we're going to take the tube out, and it's going to shrink even more. And then we're going to say, go ahead and breathe on your own. And when they struggle, then we have to do other things. So let's uh, see if there's more questions. Yes, sir. So do you wean um, people directly off APRB? We can do that. You know, we typically increase the time high to 30 seconds. And in fact, we try to have this uh, rule where you have to be at 30 seconds if, you're, if your P high is down to 20. In other words, we want to see that you're almost a CPAP before we switch you to CPAP. Because a, a T high of 30 seconds is essentially two releases per minute. That's almost CPAP. And again, we look at indices of, of your ability to breathe. So we do that little test. If you pass that test, we move you down to CPAP. Because we need some... Question, do they go over to ASD? Or do, so yes, in the States, they would typically try to take them off APRV, they look good, let's just go over to pressure support. 
right? GSB, is that what you're... Yeah, we don't do that. We go straight to CPAP. And again, the idea here is to morph CPAP with release to pure CPAP without release or whatever you want to call it. So the idea is to just lose the, lose the black stuff or the blue stuff here and gain the gray stuff. We're trying to slowly spread the machine apart and have the patient put more of their breathing in there until they're actually doing the bulk of the work and they're comfortable. Because that's what you need. At some point when they're on CPAP, they're just like you and I, except you're breathing on a platform of zero and your lungs are pressure independent. And what we're trying to find out there is where can we make your, how do we get your lungs pressure independent, maintain your lung volume? Because lung volume is what keeps us comfortably breathing. I mean, no question, there's a lot of other volumes that are in the lung, tidal volume, uh, but I don't think we can just p pick out one volume in the lung and say that's the most important. I think we have to think of lung volume as a whole in general also, because a lot of that is connected. Dr. Bashi originally termed it drop and stretch, and it's a, it's a way to actually reduce the mean airway pressure very slowly, because if you drop the pressure without increasing time, you're going to really take a big hit with your mean airway pressure. Yeah, that's and a good... typically when you're patient, when you'll see they'll start getting tachypneic, they're not as comfortable because they've had a bigger loss of mean airway pressure. Yeah. Whereas if you take it from pressure but give it to time... Can you show that on the ventilator penny? So what she's talking about is the area under the pressure curve is the mean airway pressure. So I would go from a P high of 24 um, down to 22, but I wouldn't just drop the pressure. Now I'm going to take the time high and I'm going to take it out from five and a half seconds out to six and a half seconds. So my mean airway pressure is relatively stable. It really hasn't changed much because even though I brought it from here, from pressure, I gave it over here to a longer period of time. Yeah. Well, well, eventually, of course, the pressure is going to be reduced. Are we still okay on time? Uh, yeah, you started a little bit late, so I think we'll okay. say another five minutes okay. or so. And if you're T high initially, let's say you're a patient and the call the lung is T high 28 or 30, and you come to me and you go to extend the T high 30 seconds. Well, we don't do it in one move, so we progressively, okay. yeah. But when you get to that long T high, the reason we find pressure for any adverse cardiovascular effects in terms of being returns. You know, we clinically we don't see that in our in our lab data doesn't support that either. In fact, uh, they're actually more hemodynamically stable even with their septic shock. And I think the pro the problem is, you know, again matching the right pressure and where your patient is on that pressure volume curve. So clearly, the right heart does not like high lung volume. It doesn't like low lung volume either. So if you look at pulmonary vascular resistance, very high at the extremes. The lowest point of pulmonary vascular resistance, at least from the right heart perspective is FRC. So FRC is the ideal position for your patient. And we, of course, I don't know that at the bedside. I don't, I don't measure that. I think it's tedious. I think it's difficult. Uh, there's error. What I simply do is just default to the patient's brainstem. And I look at the patient's neural interaction. And I know that the brainstem is getting all kinds of feedback back to the brain uh, from the system. It's looking at stretch receptors, and it's telling the respiratory muscles what to do. So by uncovering that, you can see a little bit of what's happening. And as long as the patient takes these nice breaths that they're not having a lot of distress, then somehow their brainstem is satiated to the point where they must be on a better part of the pressure volume curve than I'm going to guess at. And so I look for those kinds of things. So it does require you to understand some of those things, which are not you know, difficult to understand. Yes, sir. Um, so, do you uh, advocate using this in patients uh, who have got uh, intracranial pathology, uh, i.e., high, high ICP or plus secondary lung injury? We do. We do actually. Yeah, you know, actually, there's some there's some very small data, but I can tell you we've done that for years. Uh, the key thing I think is the sooner you do it in someone like that, the better. Uh, the reason is that, you know, if you do have collapsed lung, if you're trying to re-recruit them, you need, you need that long T high, and so you lose diffusive ventilation by having low surface area. It may come back as you recruit the lung, but that may take 12, 24 hours, and generally you can't tolerate high ICPs for that period of time. So that's sort of the caveat there. So, but if you do it early, and actually APRV is associated with better cerebral blood flow, better spinal flow, better gut flow,
and especially if you do this with spontaneous breathing. So, and again, in our head injured patients, we're actually using more dexmedetomidine than before, trying to minimize the propofol. We used to use a very high doses of propofol. Uh, we've minimized that a little bit. We sometimes use them both together, uh, you know, to spare. We use it as a propofol sparing device. And, and what you'll find is that you can get these patients to breathe. Most head injured patients actually breathe too much, not at all, not that they don't breathe at all. So. Uh, you, you don't have to do that. You don't have to get them breathing, but that always helps uh, uh, lower central pressures and so on. It comes back to where are you in the pressure volume relationship. A normal person, their ICPs could go up if their lung volume becomes too high and the pressure in the thoracic cavity goes up. But if you're using, and, uh, you know, if you're going from a low lung volume to me medium lung volume, then you don't see these adverse effects. It's really when you overdo it for that patient or underdo it for that patient. But hypercapnia is a problem during this technique. Essentially, a CPAP uh, with release. Uh, and no. how often it occurs? Yeah. How you manage this? Yeah, so, you know, typically in an adult patient, a T high of three to five seconds, to three to six seconds, and you know, we usually start at five, a T high of. This is for an adult. And that almost always gives you a low, slightly low PCO2. So we actually have low PCO2. So the rate in APRV is usually under 20. It's closer to 10, 12, the total rate. And it doesn't like high rates. So at some point, if you try to increase the rate with APRV, you're actually making it more bulk ventilation than diffusion. The longer time you have, the more diffusion you get. But for diffusion to occur, you need surface area. So that's why you're, you're really going to rarely find a CO2 problem when you do this from the very beginning when the lung is actually fairly healthy. We always need the P-low at zero. We always use it. I mean, years ago, we had a, a arbitrary P-low of five, two, something like that. But we later found out that that was not necessarily. And that's where you actually see hypercarbia. If you want to have a harder time clearing CO2, just dial in a, a small P-low. You're going to see a lot more hypercarbia. So here, we actually are able to improve the CO2 clearance by reducing that, that pressure low. I think that's actually a very common thing. The literature just doesn't support that hyper, that CO2 removal is actually more efficient in APRV. Luigi. Please. <clears throat> Fascinating as always. So just following up the some of those questions, let's say you do have hypercapnia. What's your, can you guide us through your thought process how you troubleshoot that? Sure, absolutely. The first thing is that we, we don't want to alter the uh, time low for hypercarbia. I think if you try to do that, and actually that was one of my earliest mistakes 20 years ago. We thought, well, just increase the T low. And what happens in that situation is the PCO2 gets better for 30 minutes, 60 so minutes. Yeah, so what, what you're doing is actually making the lung more unstable. And what you'll find is the PO2 goes down, and now the PCO2 is actually higher than what prompted you to make that change in the first place. Mm. So really, that, that controller is to maintain end expiratory lung volume. And we can, it would take a long discussion to tell you how we arrived at 75% of the peak expiratory flow, but I'm happy to do that for anyone who's interested and might get bored in the stories. But uh, that's really the balance point between keeping the lung stable at end expiratory so that's not where you go to fix it. So where you go to fix it is really your P high and your T high. So the first choice would be to make sure that you actually have enough pressure that you have optimal alveolar volume. Now again, it's easy to say that up here. In reality, of course, we're, we're trying to look at things uh, end tidal. I'm, I mean, we can, uh, maybe I can show a, a very interesting slide with end tidal. You can use capnography and things like that to give you a, an idea of where you are with recruitability. You can do little tests to see if someone's recruitable. And that's what you want to first do, is, is this P high adequate? And of course, you can always look at the patient. Look at the patient, feel their stomach, feel their belly. If it's a big, tight abdomen and your P high is 25, th there may be a good chance that you need to get closer to 30 on that patient. So those are some you know, critical things. The other thing is the combination of pressure and time might improve recruitment and CO2 will go down, even though the bulk rate has gone down. A little counterintuitive, but if you increase diffusion, you actually don't need as many frequencies. And then, of course, you do have the option to reduce the T low. Uh, sorry, the T high. Penny, can, oh, you're on standby. Uh, 
so if you reduce that, you will increase the bulk ventilation rate. Yes. And the way I think of it is that we, we go down to, in some extreme cases, we go down to 80% of the pressure cycle to be the CPAP phase. We might lose something there in terms of alveolar stability, recruitment, and so on, but you still will gain it eventually. So you can actually shorten your, your, your T high to give you uh, the final piece to CO2 control, what which is that you're relying on bulk ventilation. I think you would do that after if you have tried it the other way and your diffusive components have reached a yes, but you equilibrium. So, you know, I, absolutely. I, think I think my P high is high enough so I have enough alveolar volume. And maybe my T high, I tried to take it out to six seconds, seven seconds, that's too much. So instead, I'm going to go back and bulk ventilate more. <coughs> But be careful of one thing, which is that the mean airway pressure can go way down by short. If you take a T high of six seconds and now make it three seconds, you've lost a lot of mean airway pressure. So you have to make it up by putting it on top. Okay. So typically, when you bring the T low, why do I keep saying T low? Sorry. But when you bring in the T high, you s will have to sort of it raise might be a the pressure. Resolution, but then you'll see and the as a yeah, as a, a general what? rule, that's what you generally have to do. Also, you can skip over that step entirely by just thinking about your patient. If someone has pulmonary fibrosis and they're on the transplant list, you're not going to get diffusion. Don't waste your time, you know, stretching them out to, to gain surface area. You're not going to recruit that lung. If the lung has the potential to recruit, then you can do that and you have to decide, do I want a blood gas that's horrible the first hour, slightly better the second hour, eventually better the sixth hour, you have to decide whether you're treating a lung or a blood gas. So recruitment always has potentially a little bit of pain while you're trying to get somewhere. Sorry, Tim. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, we played with AWP for the last two years having met Dr. Hibashi, and I think a good way to start learning how to use it is in weaning patients. I think that's a safe time when you want the patient breathing, and it's a good way to become familiar with the strategy and the technique and understand the nuances of it. I just want to ask you a question, which I know the answer to, but can you, I think for the audience it's useful, can you just explain why, in your sort of thoughts, the very large tidal volume that you often see on the pressure release, which is sometimes way above six months per kilo, isn't a problem? That's a trick question? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know for sure that it's not a problem. Of course, we have data to show, despite these tidal volumes, it's very lung protective. In fact, it stops uh, lung injury. I think the important thing is to decide whether there's a connection between the micro and the macro ventilation. And I think that's really an imp generally an important concept uh, because when we're talking about 6 mLs, the whole idea is to prevent alveolar over distension. And in fact, that's the mechanistic answer that you will get when you say, what is the mechanistic reason for benefit uh, at the alveolar level? Uh, or, or from low tidal volume strategy. Of course, I can't find the slide I'm looking for. Um, but uh, maybe you guys can recall the, um, the difference. Oh, here we go, finally. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the idea is that at the alveolar level, and I say this sometimes and people think I'm crazy, so I'll just say it again. I think APRV might be a better low tidal volume strategy. And the paradox there is the paradox that we've gone through with the macroventilatory parameters you see. The tidal volume is huge. We know that's injurious. Low, no PEEP setting, that's injurious. Big amplitude, injurious. Yet the data shows completely the opposite. So the disconnect could be that there's nonlinearity between what we see on the outside of the ventilator and what's happening in the lung. And I, I, in an editorial in Critical Care Medicine that's coming out soon, I, I make that point using uh, hemodynamics or macro circulatory shock resuscitation versus micro circulatory sh shock and the two are not linear. So I think if we want to broaden our perspective a little bit about mechanical ventilation, we need to look more at the, uh, um, at the alveolar level. And just very, very quickly, what we find is that this alveolus has a greater change and this is some of the new data we're trying to uh, put together. So what's happening is you have less alveoli contributing to the total tidal volume that's going to ultimately come out. Uh, but they're actually bigger and scattered in size, as you can see here. This is low tidal volume strategy between 
the two after lung injury. And in APRV, we have smaller, more uniform alveoli, and they change very little. But then you get a huge volume, because every single one of them just had to give up a little bit. So there could be that paradox. Of course, I can't prove that yet, but we have some preliminary data to suggest that that may be something that's really important to investigate and understand better. Um, because maybe we do want to use low tidal volume strategy. We just maybe haven't figured it out. You know, what seems intuitive on the surface may not really translate to what we want at this level and the counter being the, the, the truth. I'm going to get trouble with this, but this poor guy has been trying to answer your question. <laughs> Sponsor, you're reading them down to basically see if level of 15, maybe Well, typically, once their P high is 20, then we skip over to, you know, 19 of CPAP because the mean airway pressure. Uh, you know, goes up a little bit if you go to 20 to 20. So the c c mean air pressure is a little bit higher. So we go to 19. This is just part of our protocol, 19, and then we take two more steps. So typically we reduce by two once you're in CPAP. We look at your rapid shallow breathing index, and then we just keep going. Because remember, this is spontaneous <coughs> breathing. So we use work of index, uh, work of breathing indices to help us uh, figure out how much load the patient has. So you, you mean down to about 15, and then you would and then we extubate if they pass their what we call monitored breathing trial. This is something else we do that's, I'm sure, unusual. <laughs> but we leave them on the ventilator for their trach collar trials or when we do a spontaneous breathing trial. We're able to see all these parameters instead of guessing at them, instead of looking at rate, especially when we're doing trach collar trials because, you know, it's a guess and we use saturation to tell us the patient's uh, finish their trial, when in reality we just fatigued that patient and wiped them out or let their lungs collapse or do something wrong, and that's the last thing to go. We're very good at reacting to the SAP monitor, but way in advance. So what we look for is how well they're breathing. So we basically turn them to zero, and then we just use the ventilator, not as a ventilator, but as a monitor. So it's something we, we do, and we find that it gives us a lot more information, and the nurses are clued into what to look for. And so it's just much easier for them to know that the patient's in distress before that occurs. So P, P high to zero? Well, the CPAP to zero, yeah, or the P high to zero, whatever you want, yeah. That but that's for... The, the most informative trait call the trial you'll ever find. Yeah, but, to, but if you're intubated endotracheally, we'll put you to zero, and typically we, we do 30, more than 30 minutes, less than 60. That's sort of our approach. I don't know if that's exactly perfect, but then we, if you maintain your rapid shallow breathing index within a range, we extubate you. Head into CPAP or just to show us the You continue with the long CPAP? Or you no, no, we usually go straight to, uh, you know, uh, aerosoled mask or nasal cannula or nothing at all. So th thank you. Thank you.